ركبت بوارق الذكرى ومن مسرا إلى مسرا صو خواطري شعرا فسبحان الذي أسرى عرفت الله في السور وفي الآيات والعبر وفي سيرورة البشر فسبحان الذي أسرى عرفت الله في الزهر وفوح نسيمه العطر وفي الأنداء والقطر فسبحان الذي أسرى الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله All right uh, Just then, therefore, as a bit of a recap from last week's class, we began by talking about the great important topic of shukr. Uh, I think we began by framing this around the fact that uh, it links very well to our uh, first class, which was on ikhlas or sincerity, knowing, of course, that in that dialogue that Iblis has with Allah in the Quran, uh, it links to ikhlas or sincerity. He said, you know, that I will mislead all of them except those of your servants who are sincere. Uh, and then in the other narration we have in the Quran, uh, where he says to Allah that I will lie in ambush for your servants on the straight path. I will strike at them from in front of them and from behind and from their right and from their left. And you will not find most people to be shakirin, to be grateful, right? And even when it comes to the ibad of Allah, the, ser the servants of Allah, remember of course that incident when Umar is walking the streets of Medina, may Allah be pleased with him, and he hears a man who is praying. <coughs> what is he saying? He's saying, Allah maj'alim min al Allah make me amongst those who are few in number. And Umar is so confused, why would you want to make a dua like that? Out of all duas you could possibly make. And he says to him, have you not heard the words of Allah in the Quran? وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ And only a few of Allah's ibad of Allah's servants are thankful to him. Right? And this is something wallahi, that is easy for us to forget. Right? In our busy lives, if you consider the, the non-Muslims kuffar, for example, you know, they are uh, occupied in their, uh, you know, in their dunya making. Right? And we are living, of course, in a very a consumer culture-based society where everyone's looking for possessions, right? In fact, it is a bit warped in these kind of days because it is not so much about the possession but more about the image of that possession. This is how capitalism has worked its wonders. Uh, uh, that's a sarcastic reference, but that's how it's done it, right? So our uh, fascination is not, is not very much with the product, it's with the image of the product. It's the way it's advertised, it appeals to us, right? This is how advertising it works, it makes us want to buy things. Uh, but, there, but we also run the risk, my dear brothers. No one is immune to this in essence, except the one that Allah has mercy on his soul. Um, because we might be over, uh, very active and very busy in our da'wah and so many things, right? But we can easily run the risk of becoming ungrateful to Allah. Definitely, right? In the Quran, remember, Allah tells us about these things uh, that, are, that we might think to be basic. Where? Have we not given the man two eyes, right? And a tongue and two lips. And showed him the two ways, guided him the two ways, the way of evil and the way of good, the way of iman and the way of kufr. Right, of Tawheed and Shirk, of good and bad, right? But how does it start? Haven't we given man two eyes and a, a tongue and two lips, right? Now Allah goes on to say what? Right? That you have all these things with you. You have your eyes and you have your lips and you have your tongue and you have guidance, right? I mean, Allah has clarified for you, this is good, this is bad but you don't climb the path that is steep and that is ascending, right? Meaning we're taking a kind of, you know, <coughs> we're not climbing the hill that is steep and that is ascending. <laughs> what will explain to you what is the hill and the path that is steep and ascending? <laughs> the path that is steep and ascending is, the first one, <laughs> you, you ransom your own neck. 
right? The Mufassirin, they say a few things, but one of them is that you, know, you save your own neck from the fire of Jahannam, or you free a slave, you know? It's active, it's not passive. Second one, or you feed a person on the, on the day of your own hunger, right? You feed a person on a day of your own hunger, right? You go hungry, so someone else goes, is, is having food, right? Yatim and the maqraba, or feeding a, 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 an orphan from an Arab kin, miskin and the matraba, or a poor person who is in Turab, who is laying in the dust, for example, okay? So but look how it started. Right? It's uh, going back to basics, if you like. Think about the things that are with you, but you forget. We, we discussed last time about what Ibn al-Qaim says about that. He calls it shukr al-am, the general kind of shukr. What is that for? al ta'am, right? wal sharab wal isn't it? Yeah? It's about the waqut al-abdan. It's about the food and the drink and the clothing and the strength of the limbs. Right? Is there any guarantee, my dear brother, that you will wake up in the morning and you will see with those two blessed eyes of yours? There is no guarantee. Right? For how many stories do you hear of people who wake up and they're semi-paralyzed, for example? Right? Or they wake up and they've lost some of their memory. <coughs> yeah? There was a famous boy, we were growing up, and this is one of those stories where uh, there was a guy from Harvard University studying law, right? Which isn't the best thing for us to study, right? It's better things to study than that. But he was studying law. Anyway, he slipped and he fell. And, um, and where he was studying, Harvard University, one of the best universities in the world, he slipped and he fell. And he uh, lost his memory. And thereafter could only have a memory that lasts five minutes. Right? A memory that lasts five minutes. And it showed his home. He has post-it notes everywhere. Right? Like, I've just done this. And I've just called mum. And I've just put the food in the microwave. And I've just put the rubbish in the bin. I've just done these things. Five minutes capacity. So there is no guarantee, my dear. This is how the Muslim and the Mu'min lives. He lives with a sense of insecurity. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib says, oh, here, This dunya here, daran man sahha fiya saqam, wa man amina fiha nadam. The dunya is a place, man sahha fiya saqam. Whoever is healthy in this place is truly sick. And whoever is as secure in this place is the one who is truly at risk. Right? Because it's delusion. And it's an illusion. Right? To have that sense, a false sense of security is where the problem is. We are not like that. وَلَا تَمْشِي فَوْقَ الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا تَوَاضَعًا فَكَمْ تَحْتَهَا مِنْ قَوْمٍ وَمِنْكَ أَرْفَعُوا Like the poet said, don't walk on the earth except with humility. How many people under the earth are better than you? And, and, and then he goes on to say, and if you think that you're safe and you're secure, how many people underneath the earth are safer than you and more secure than you? Right? So we live with a sense of... Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, not with a sense of assurity, right? Because we're not entirely sure. Then we moved on to shukr al khas, al iman wa tawheed wa quwwat al qulub, and the specific shukr which is uh, concerning one's iman and tawheed and the strength of his heart. And this is something, of course, that transcends above and beyond uh, focusing on the outer. This is something that is concerned with the inner, the inner state of a Muslim where his iman and his tawheed and his. Um, and his heart rests, right? We thank Allah for that, that Allah made you Muslim. Allah made you from the greatest Ummah, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah gave you the gift of Iman, the gift of Tawheed and Kufr bil Ta'ud. Allah gave you these as blessings from Him, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, that is the greatest. We, we discussed that uh, statement of uh, Sahli bin Abdullah. Remember when the man came to me and says, you know, a thief has entered my house and stolen my stuff, right? What did he say as a response to him? Why the thief entered your house? Yeah, okay, good. So he said, thank Allah, right? Ishkurillah. Thank Allah, because if the thief of your heart entered your heart and that's shaitan and he corrupted your belief, what would you do then, right? So think about, I still have the gift of Iman, alhamdulillah. And that is, a, that is a, the main thing uh, that should give us a, a great sense of happiness in our, in our deen. And alhamdulillah, we went through several other things as well. Um, we... Um, yeah, we went through examples, some cases of like uh, Ibn Qayyim sites, you know, people, loved the, the one who was a leper and he was lying in the dust, remember that one, right? And he, uh, all of his stuff was going and the man asked him, why are you shayin baqiya alaykum min al-ni'ma tahmudullah alayhi? What, what, do you, what remains with you? You're still thanking Allah for, you have nothing to thank Allah for. And then he shows him, teaches him, wait, look at the people of the city. Look how many people there are in the city. Yeah? And the man looks and then he turns back and says, what's up with that? 
And he says, well, look, shouldn't I praise Allah that out of all these people, Allah chose only to test me, right? That Allah singled me out for being tested and trying, right? That I am experiencing pain and suffering and everyone else is living fine. That means I must be special in some respect, right? So we should not forget that, right? And never moan and bemoan <coughs> because, of course, uh, the uh, task for us, of course, is to be patient when we are given an afflict affliction and a trial. But we also, if you remember, discussed in light of this the uh, distinction between the one who is Shakir and Shakur, right? So what's the distinction between these two? What's, what's the difference between them? Shakir. Shakir. Shakir praises when he has something to do yeah. with Shakur praises even though there's something to Yeah, exactly. All right. So he is defined by Shakur. That's the thing, isn't it? It's fa'ul, it's emphasis, right? It's like this guy, you know what? He's always pray. He's always thankful. Right? You give him a penny, he's thankful. Give him 10 pounds, he's thankful. He, he's always thankful. Whatever comes his way, he's thankful to his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we discussed that in light of the hadith of Prophet Sallam <coughs> on the authority of Umar <coughs> Muneen, Aisha, when she came and she saw him praying and his feet had swollen up and she said, what to him? Afala akuna? Sorry, he said, Ma'a atasna hadha. You're doing this when Allah has forgiven your past and his future and everything. And then he said to her, uh, her? أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shouldn't I be a truly grateful servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then we, in light of that, we spoke about the example of Arwa ibn Zubair, rahmatullah uh, alayhi. Do you remember his example, right? When he lost his son and then he lost his limb and then he says, Oh, I should think about what I still have with me, right? And we kind of framed all of that, I think, at the end around the hadith. انظروا إلى من أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم. Look to those who have less than you, not to those who have more than you. Right? Because the Prophet said, if you look to those who have more than you, it will make you undermine, underestimate the favor of Allah upon you. Right? Because if you're always looking to those who have more than you, then you, you forget the favor of Allah upon you. Allah has already given you a lot compared to so many millions and millions and millions of others. Right? And that's the way that we should <coughs> look at it. Now, if I remember, my dear brothers, we, we, where did we stop, by the way? Do you remember where we stopped? I think we stopped like uh, on that verse, 34, 30, 34, 13, and only a few of my servants are grateful. <coughs> Is that one? Yeah. Good. Yeah? Okay. So we will continue, inshallah, from there. Uh, but you see, I, 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 don't, I, think, I don't think we spoke about something very important that I, we had to finish off. This is why we decided to finish this first, inshallah, before we move on. And that was the fact that, look, my dear brothers in Islam, Allah made us human beings. You know, Allah made us human beings, uh, and human beings socially interact with one another. You know, we speak to each other on a daily basis. You know, we eat food with one another. We are company. In fact, even in etymology, you know where the word company comes from? Company, companion, companionship. It came in fact from the from German, the Germanic tribes when they would travel from the north to the south to trade with the southerners. Um, they would share bread with them because they had to do that because they were trading with one another, right? So they had to share bread with each other. That then therefore become accommodated into the vulgar Latin. Um, and now we have it in English with a direct translation, com pani. Com means with and pani from the panier means bread, with bread, right? You know, it means sharing bread with one another. That's company, it means with bread. <laughs> That's where the word comes from, with bread, right? So that means that when we are company, when we are companions, for example, it means we're doing things together. We are sharing things together. We are interacting with one another. In that process, alhamdulillah, we will do some good things for people, right? And we will be on the receiving end of good things as well. We will need to reciprocate the goodness. And so he said in the hadith, Man la nas la Allah. This is different now. Whoever doesn't thank the people hasn't thanked Allah. Man la nas la Allah. Whoever hasn't thanked the people hasn't thanked Allah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be thankful to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and thankful to people. Right? Because human beings, people, also do good things for other, other people, human beings. And what is prime out of all of this, my dear brothers, is what Allah mentions in the Qur'an, 
when Allah said, وَوَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُهُ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا أَلَى وَحْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ Right? When Allah has said He has enjoined upon man to be dutiful to his parents, his mother carried him with hardship, وَحْنًا أَلَى وَحْنٍ Travail after travail, hardship after hardship. Right? And the weaning was for two years. أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ Thank me and thank your parents. إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ To me is the goal. Right? And Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abbas, he says there are three things in the Quran that come as duels, as pairs, that can never be separated. One of them is, أَطِيَ اللَّهُ وَأَطِيَ الرَّسُولِ أَبَيَ اللَّهُ أَنَ بَيَ ذَا الرَّسُولِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَامُ Thani and the second one, أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةُ وَأَتُ الزَّكَاةُ Establish salah and pay the zakat. And the third one is this one, أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَلِدَيْكِ Thank me and thank your parents. Right? That cannot be separated. So we have uh, an enormous debt that we owe to our parents, my dear brothers. What tends to happen, although we sometimes complain uh, <coughs> to others, that, you know, look how sometimes people who don't have deen, they treat their, not all of them, but some of them, treat their parents or treat their, you know, elderly folk. Uh, they stick them in old people's homes and this and that. Things happen, right? It's important for us to take nuanced perspectives in this regard. My mom, she is a, uh, a relief worker, you know, so she helps people who are undergoing, like, domestic violence and stuff like that, right? So... Uh, you know, the things that plague other communities also plague our communities, right? You know, you, you will hear awful stories from non-Muslims, you will also, also hear awful stories from Muslims, in fact, all right? So because we live with them, we tend to do the same things that they do, all right? So we should take a nuanced perspective in this regard. But the point is this, what does Allah say? <coughs> thank me and thank your parents. Now let's take the examples of the companions of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How were they with their parents? And take the example of prophets. Like Allah mentioned the example of Isa Alayhi Salaam in the Quran. Like Allah says, وَبَرًا بِوَالِدَتِي Right? He was good with birr, piety towards his mother. And Allah says, he did, Allah, did not make me, Allah did not make me miserable towards her. Right? Allah did not make me wretched and miserable towards her. We also have the example of Yahya alayhi salam that is recounted in the Quran. And we have the example of the companions of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa Famous examples. Like who? Take the example of Abu Huraira, for example. Radiallahu ta'ala an. This companion, of course, initially went to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa because his mother wasn't a Muslim. And he <coughs> went and he, he, he said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for my mother. And then just there and then, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa of course, you know the, the, the hadith, he says, Allah mahdi um Abu Huraira. Allah guide the mother of Abu Huraira, right? And by the time he went back home, she had become a Muslim, right? She had already become a Muslim. Now, thereafter, whenever uh, Abu Huraira's mother would give salam to her, uh, her son and vice versa, when he would give salam to his mother, he would say, Assalamu alaikum ya umata. Assalamu alaikum ya umata wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Rahimakillah kama rabbaytani saghira. This is their salutation. Peace be upon you, my dear mother, and the mercy of Allah and His blessing. May Allah have mercy on you because of how you looked after me when I was young. Right? And then she would say, Wa alayka salam ya bunay wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Rahimakallah kama barratani kabira. And salam to you and Allah's mercy and blessings on you. Uh, may Allah have mercy on you because of how you're looking after me now that I'm old. Right? And they had this sense of reciprocation between themselves. How much was it emphasized, considered the narration of Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, when a man came and says to him, you know, حَمَلْتُ أُمِّي إِلَى رَقْبَتِي مِنْ مِنْ خُرَسَانِ حَتَّى قَدَيْتُ إِلَى الْمَنَاسِكِ I carried my mother on my neck from Khurasan. Uh, this is for the Hajj, by the way, right? Going for the Hajj, the manasik, the rituals of the Hajj. And what does he say to her? What does he say to him, sorry? He says, أَتَعَانِي جَزَيْتُهَا Do you think I've now paid my mother back? For this, uh, you know, I understand, of course, she done so much for me when I was young. Uh, but I, I did this big thing for her by carrying her on my neck, like on my back. Uh, do you think I paid her back? What does he say to him as a lesson for him? He says, wahida." <coughs> Not even for one contraction have you paid your mother back. Right? Not even for one contraction when she was having labor pains have you paid your mother back. Now you see, we forget this, my dear brothers. Sometimes we become so occupied in our trying to save the world, right, from the kufr and the shirk and the bid'ah that they're in, right, we forget this. 
it becomes like trivial for us, right? It becomes like, yeah, but you know, my mom, she doesn't understand Tawheed, right? Yeah, she just jahil. People say this. I did a talk once, subhanAllah, in a masjid, and a, the brother asked a question, and he says, yeah, what, what, what should I do if my mom's jahil? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> you know, I said, look, human empathy would dictate what? Consider the events from your mother's perspective, isn't it? You understand? It's a basic lesson in sociology. Understand, imagine who you are, your mom. <laughs> okay, your mom's raised you. She's changed your nappy, she's fed you, she's clothed you, she's funded you, she's given you support, she's looked after you, she had, you know, sleepless nights when you came home late. All these things that mothers experience, yeah? You know, when you passed your exams, she felt as if she passed her exams, isn't it? You understand, yeah? All right, so now you've kind of, you've, you're in your teens still, I guess, you're, you're like 17 or 18, you know? But a few years ago, you were still 13 and 14, and you were preparing for your mom, bought you your GCSE textbooks and everything else, and you, whatever. 17, 18, you, you managed to read a pamphlet in a masjid, right? Okay, and the pamphlet says something, and you think, subhanAllah, right? That means my mom's jayam, right? Okay. So you make an obvious conclusion, right? Because you read a pamphlet and stuff. And the mother, maybe she doesn't know much. Maybe she is jahil in some respect. Maybe she has some, you know, she has some ignorance in her. She doesn't understand deen as well as perhaps you are learning now. But what kind of attitude would you take with your mother? Yeah? What kind of attitude would you take with your mother? <coughs> it should be one utterly of mercy. Yeah? Let me clarify it for you. There's a beautiful poem called Fu'ad al-Um. Listen carefully. Fu'ad al-Um. The heart of the mother. And remember this poem. The poet, he said, أغرم رأن يوم الغلام جاهلا بنقوده كيما ينال به الوطر قال ائتني بفؤاد أمك يا فتاة ولك الدراهم والجواه والدرر A man came to a very young boy and said, listen to me. He said, listen to me, go and uh, go and bring me the heart of your mother. Go and bring me the heart of your mother. And if you do, then I promise you uh, coins and rubies and pearls if you brought me the heart of your mother. And it happened like that. And so he took his knife and he went and he plunged the knife in his mother's chest and her heart he took out and he went back. He went back. But in this boy's haste, right, he's running and he slips. And when he slips, he trips and he falls. And when he falls, his mother's heart that he was exchanging for a few copper coins falls out of his hand, right? And it rolls in the dust. And his mother's heart cries out and says, My beloved son, are you in any pain? Right. Are you in any pain? Right? And this boy, he, there is a rogma hanuihim, and so there is a, a blessedness from his mother's voice, softness. But he understands there is ghadabun min as in hamar, that there is anger from the heavens coming upon him. So what does he do? Fastalla khinjaran li yat'ana nafsihi ta'nan, fa asbaha ibratan li munu'tubir. He takes a knife again, but this time points it towards himself. Right? A stabbing. A stabbing that becomes an example for everyone who will learn an example. Nadahu qalbul um. Waladi habibi kufa yadan wala taqtul fu adi marratain al al athar. His mother's heart cries out a second time and says, My beloved son, stop your hand and don't stab me twice in the same place. Right? It's like our hearts are connected to other, our mother's hands. When you fail your exam, your mother's failed her exam, right? When you passed your exam, your mother's passed her exams. You get a job, your mother thinks she's got a job, right, isn't it? You know, you, you get married, your mother thinks she's married again. You know, it's, 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 it's true, isn't it? And if you dare get a divorce, it's not, you know, all right? So there is like this connection Allah has placed between the hearts of the mother and the heart of the, of the child. We should not forget that. And sometimes, you know, I, I think my experience, we do. You know, we become so busy and thou alhamdulillah trying to save everyone, but we forget the thing also about the rights that Allah has established upon, um, upon the mother and upon the father. Look at the father, for example. In another narration, I think it's Ibn Umar again, may Allah be pleased with him, when the man came, and there were two men coming, one man uh, younger at the front and one man older at the back. And Ibn Umar asked the front, one at the front, you know, man who is this man with you? He says, Abi, my father. 
He says, a book, subhanallah, فَلَا تَمْشِي فَوْقَهُ وَلَا تَجْلِسْ قَبْلَهُ Then don't ever walk in front of your father and don't ever sit before he sits and don't ever call him by his first name. Right? Well, we forget that, right? Because we're just busy, you know, fixing the world's problems, right? But you forget the small things. Well, they're not small, they're massive, but we forget that, right? Think about the occasion, Ibn Umar, or Abu Huraira, one of them I can't remember very well. I think it's Ibn Umar, but anyway, he was riding with his companions in Medina, and he, um, a man walked past him, and he was wearing an amama, a turban, and he was riding his, uh, his uh, donkey, I think, or horse or donkey. Anyway, he comes off, and, uh, and it was hot, and he comes off, and he stops this man, and he says, Alisa, are you not this Fulan ibn Falan? Are you not like this person, the son of this person? And the man says, I am that person that you're talking about. And he takes off his amam and he places it on this man's head. And he says, Irkab hadha, write this, right? And off you go on your journey. And Ibn Umar's <coughs> companions are amazed, like, why would, you, why would you do that when you know that it's hot and you need this camel, or this donkey, sorry, and you need this uh, turban, why would you do that? And this is from the hadith. Because he said, indeed, I heard that, that the Muslim said, it is from the bir, it is from the piety, that you would show goodness to your father's friend after your father passed away. Now, this person who was in Medina, in the heat, was not the friend of, of Sayyidina Umar. He was the son of the friend of Sayyidina Umar. Right? But that is how far he extended it. <laughs> right? That is how far he extended it. Right? Like, it's that, that far, but I will make sure that I am joining the ties of relationship uh, that Allah has mandated upon us uh, in our religion. So my dear brothers, we should remember these. All right? So this of course is all framed around the, the fact that we have to uh, thank others. Whoever doesn't thank the people hasn't thanked Allah. Uh, but foremost in that, therefore, is thanking your parents. Uh, that Allah mentions in the Quran and these are just some narrations that will help you understand uh, its great importance and so here we are Nabi Sallallahu is reported to have stayed up in prayer all night oh we just mentioned that I guess right we mentioned that okay uh, okay and so the Prophet Sallallahu once told Mu'ad ibn Jabal by Allah you are dear to me in fact that is not the correct translation it's a beautiful hadith perhaps you might have heard of it before when he took Mu'ad ibn Jabal by the hand Right? He took him by the hand and says, What ya Mu'ad inni uhibbuk, Mu'ad, I love you. Right? Now from that of course is many beautiful things because many of the early ulama would incorporate this kind of method in their teaching, right? Where they would take the students' hands, right? To establish an, a sense of close affinity, right? Because it's proximity, right? Because I'm taking you by the hand, that means I have care and love for you. Right? That means it's close between me and you, there's closeness between us. Right? Not that you kind of, you know, shouting at the end of the road and, you know, you're trying to... No, this closeness, right? He says, Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuk, Mu'ad, I love you. Right? So what Mu'ad, of course, is listening very carefully, right? And of course, from this, we know the other hadith, when Nabi Sallam is sitting with another Sahabi, and another man walked past. And that Sahabi says, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, inni uhibbu al-hada. Indeed, Ya Rasulullah, I love this person. Right? And the Prophet said to him, Have you told him? And he said, No. And the Prophet said, go and tell him then. And he gets up and he tells, you know, inni uhibbuk, indeed I love you. And then the man says, ahbabtani lahu. May he for whose sake you love me, love you also, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, in any case, he says to Mu'adh, Ya Mu'adh, inni uhibbuk, Mu'adh, I love you, faqul, so say something. Right, so Mu'adh, of course, is going to remember what is, gonna, what is told to say because it's incepted by love. Right, what does it make? How, how the instruction came, how it was formulated, right? So he says to him, Faqul so say, what? Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. We read five times a day after our salawat, right? Oh Allah, I ask for your own, I ask for your support, right? To remember you and to thank you. This is about shukr and to make shukr to you and to worship you well. Because remember, of course, there is no thanking Allah, except that it's coming as a uh, as tawfiq, or as own from Allah. SubhanAllah, like we mentioned the poet last time, إِذَا كَانَ شُكْرِ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ نِعْمَةً عَلَيَّ لَهُ فِي مِثْلِهَا يَجِبُ الشُكْرُ فَكَيْفَ وَقُوءُ الشُكْرِ إِلَّا بِفَضِّهِ وَإِنْ طَالَتِ الْأَيَامُ وَاتَّصَلَ الْعُمْرُ إِذَا كَانَ شُكْرِ If my shukr is by itself a ni'mah from Allah, then it requires another shukr. 
right? كل نعمة على العبد من الله سبحانه وتعالى يحتاج إلى شكر. Every نعمة, every favor from Allah to His servants requires شكر. ثم التوفيق إلى شكر نعمة أخرى يحتاج إلى شكر الثاني. Ibn Rajab said, that, right? Every blessing from Allah requires a shukr, and every shukr then is another blessing that requires another shukr, right? And then, thumma tawfiq ila shukr thani, having the tawfiq to make the second shukr is another blessing that requires another shukr. Wa hakadha al abd. And like that, the servant can never truly thank Allah entirely because every time he does so, that is Allah is inspiring him to thank him. So there's another blessing, right? So we should realize we are weak and meek and humble servants of our Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala because you can never be truly thankful to him but we remember the hadith in which he said whoever says in the morning man asbaha bi man ni'matan aw bi ahadin min khalqik fa minka wahdaka la sharika lak fa lak alhamd wa lak shukr and everyone was supposed to have learned that right you know ma asma asbaha bi man ni'matan ma asbaha bi man ni'matan right whatever i have woken up with of ni'ma me and khalqik, your creation. Faminka, then it's from you. Wahdak, you alone, right? La sharika lak, no partners you have. Falak al hamd, and for you is the hamd. Walak al shukr, and for you is shukr, right? And we dealing with both of the, like Ibn al Qayyim says for, uh, about shukr, what does it stem from? Where does hamd come from? Fa inna shukr yaqa abil jawarih, wa inna al hamd yaqa abil qalb wa lisan. That the shukr comes from the limbs and the hamd comes from the tongue and it comes from the heart, right? So to be from the shakirin doesn't mean you just sit back and alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. That's all good, but you're making hamd to Allah from your tongue and from your heart. But to be from the shakirin, what do you do then? You use what Allah has given you, the ni'ma, the amana of money. You use it for Allah's sake, the limbs, the hands, the eyes, the ears, and you're using it for Allah's sake. You're thanking Allah then for the eyes and the ears and the hands and the feet and so on and so forth. And so this is a very beautiful hadith that we should... Uh, we should be reading this, of course, after our five daily prayers anyway. Gratitude is uh, linked to Allah's generosity and it is what makes it increase. Um, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, Join Allah's generosity towards you to your gratitude towards Him. Right? So, yeah, we mentioned that. I think something similar last time. And then it goes on. Uh, we also have this one over here. Uh, Ibn Abi Dunya reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib, I was pleased with him, said to a man from the tribe of Hamazan, Allah's generosity is connected to his gratitude, is connected to gratitude, sorry, and gratitude is linked to increase in his generosity. The generosity of Allah will not stop increasing unless the gratitude of his servant ceases. Right? Alaykum bi mudawamati shukr, fa kullu ni'matan zalat an qawmin fa'adat ilayhim. Right? Remember that? We mentioned that last time. Right? That it's upon you to be. Make a lot of shukr because every favor that was taken away from a, a, a nation is returned to them. Like Ibn Qayyim would say, if you see loss in your affairs and you think, well, how can I have so much loss? The first thing to do is fastaqabal shukr, begin to make shukr, right? Because maybe in many cases that is a missing link because Allah promises by way of shukr, la'azidannakum. Wa in kafartum in adabi la shadid. If you make shukr, Allah increases you. And if you're ungrateful, then the punishment of Allah is severe. Al Hassan said, speak about his generosity frequently, for speaking about it is gratitude. As for the ni'mah of your Lord, hadith, proclaim. Uh, Allah commanded his messenger وسلم, to speak of his Lord's generosity in this ayah, here we are, and speak about the blessing of your Lord. And then it continues, my dear brothers. Um, uh, you see, we have covered much of what is for. I don't know if, I, if you have this, what I'm reading, because maybe you don't, isn't it? No, oh, you don't have it. We have it from last week. Last I see, week. you didn't bring your notes from last week. You should have bring your notes. <coughs> um, okay, we can perhaps draw to an end, I think, with this chapter, because we did start it last week and now we've. Said a bit more this week, alhamdulillah, my colleagues, of course, that you understand you know, the great importance of, do you understand the great importance of sugar? Yeah, does it make sense to you? Well, I had here like a few perhaps exercises that we could uh, try and do because this is one, of course, that we have to reignite the spirit. Um, the first thing I had is like, you know, look, always try and acknowledge uh, 
the good. Always try and acknowledge the good, right? The small of it and the great of it. Always try and, and acknowledge the goodness. Try and see the goodness in things, yeah? You know, I mean, that will go a long way to stop us being people of moaning and complaining all the time. See where the blessing lies in, in your affairs. The small and the great of those things. Secondly, think of... So I had here, like, disconnects to thanking people, yeah? Think of someone who has done something good for you and you haven't thanked them fully and pay them a visit, right? To thank them fully, right? Think of someone. Remember Ibn Qayyim's statement, Thank the one who does you a favor and do a favor to the one who thanks you, right? This is like a cycle. Imagine the Muslims were living like in that kind of cycle, right? We're always reciprocating, always kind of giving back. Thanking those who do us a favor and doing favors to those who thank us. Right? We're always thanking, always giving, always doing favors for people, right? So maybe there is a person that, you know, has done a lot of good for us, and we've barely managed to say thank you very much for that, right? Uh, you know, we should uh, make sure that we, um, we do our job and, and, and show gratitude to them for the good that they have done. Uh, this is how Allah is, you know, it's like Ibn, what Ibn Al-Qaim says, you know, subhanahu wa ta'ala rahim, wa subhanahu wa ta'ala rahim, wa min ruhama. Allah is merciful, and Allah loves the merciful ones, and Allah will be merciful to those who are merciful to others, right? Allah is rafiq, Allah is compassionate, and Allah loves rifq, Allah loves compassion, and Allah will be compassionate to those who are compassionate to others, right? Allah covers the sins, sata Allah is, and Allah loves to cover the sins, and Allah will cover the sins of those who cover the sins of others on this earth. Right? So it's not just about us and Allah, it's about us and creation at the same time. Right? Because we're human beings, we're living with people, so we must fulfill our <coughs> rights towards them. And the thirdly, I had like as an exercise, you know, every, every day before you sleep, um, try and think of a few things uh, that went well in your day. Right? Think of a few things that went well in your day um, uh, to increase the memory of your of your blessing that came your way. It's easy to forget because you think, well, there's so many great things happened today, all right, let's sleep, <laughs> right? It's time to rest, right? But just think, over the blessings, from the morning till the evening, you know, you woke up with food. Is that a blessing? What about the hadith? Man asbaha aminan fi sirbihi, mu'afan fi badanihi, inda wukutu yawmihi. Right, whoever wakes up, aminan fi sirbihi, he wakes up safe and secure in his home. Right, mu'afan, preserved in his limbs and his body and he has enough provisions to last him the day, then it's as if he has captured the entire dunya. It's as if he has captured the entire dunya. Right? So you think back, well, hold on, I, I woke up and I was secure and safe in my home. <coughs> I, I was healthy in my limbs, and I had enough provisions for the day, enough money that was last me to get food for the day. That means I could capture the entire dunya. I have more than what millions upon millions of people don't have in this dunya. So just harken back and think about the blessings that come your way. And number four, I had you know, develop an attitude of gratitude. Right? There's a rhyme there. Right? <laughs> develop. And I had another one actually that in, 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 uh, in gratefulness there is greatness, isn't it? All right? There's greatness in, in gratefulness. So we should remember that. All right. Shall we move on then, inshallah, to the new chapter? You guys, are you okay then with shukr? Do you understand it, right? <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, we are now on chapter 3 of this book called Types of uh, Heart. This chapter is about the heart. Now, we of course have already said some things about the heart uh, over the last few weeks. We've kind of incorporated a lot about the heart um, and its connection to the nafs. Remember, we went through the definitions of nafs al-lawama, al-maratun bisu, and nafs al inna. And what was the definition of nafs al-lawama? Anyone remembers? How do we define nafs al-lawama? That is the nafs that is it's a good nafs, right? It's because it's self-reproaching. It's good, it's Imam Jurjani says it's kind of it's illuminated by the light of the heart. But remember, if the heart has succumbed to ghafla, then that nafs will always be in that state, isn't it? It won't rise or ascend to nafs al inna the nafs that is uh, content and the nafs that is at peace and content. Uh, so, so it's very important, therefore, for us to get the heart 
thing right, isn't it? Because that will then dictate what the nafs will end up to be like. If the, if the heart is astray and a wayward, then the nafs will, the lower self, lower self will have more of an, um, uh, you know, more of a way, if you like, you know, with the, with the Muslim or with the human being. He will succumb to his desires and these kind of things. Uh, <coughs> just as a heart may be described in terms of being alive or dead, it may also be regarded as belonging to one of three types. These are the healthy heart, the dead heart, and the sick heart. Um, so it begins with the healthy heart then. Uh, on the day of resurrection, only those who come to Allah with a healthy heart will be saved. For Allah says in the, in the verse, that perhaps you know, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفِعُ مَالًا وَلَا بَانُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Right? يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفِعُ مَالًا وَلَا بَانُونَ On that day, nothing will benefit. Not mal, not wealth, and not children. Right? Not these things. So it's not these external things possessions, things, but it's the one who comes to Allah with a sound <coughs> heart, right? If you remember the hadith, if I mentioned it last time, but the hadith about the man who has thalatha to akhilla, he has three intimate friends, ahaduhum, maluhu, one of them is his wealth, right? He sees his money as, there's a verse in the Quran, in fact, where Allah says, um, uh, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكْرَ وَالْأُنْثَى إِنَّ سَعْيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُ يَسِرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَ وَاسْتَغْنَى وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُ يَسِرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَى وَمَا يُغْنِي وَمَا يُغْنِي مَالُهُ إِذَا إِذَا تَرَدَّى إِذَا So what will his wealth benefit him when he's in the grave? When he's in the grave, what will his what wealth what his will his wealth profit him in? In fact, this ayah is beautiful. If you look at the what it means, Allah takes the oath by the night as it veils, and by the day tajalla as it comes in glory, right? And by the male and the female, right? And what does Allah say? In the in the sayyakum la Indeed, your sa'i, like your efforts are shatta, diverse, diverse, opposites, different. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى As for the one who gives, spends, fi sabil Allah. He gives, this is his quality. The first thing Allah describes him with is فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى As for the one who gives, وَالتَّقَى He has taqwa, right? And he believes in the good, then Allah makes it easier for him the life of ease, happiness. But as for the one who is a miser, he sees himself self-sufficient and independent, then he uh, will have, Allah will make and he disbelieves in the good, Allah makes it easy for him the life towards misery and hardship. Um, and then Allah says, and what, what will your wealth profit you in when you're in the grave? So in this hadith that I began with, uh, he, the man has three friends, intimate friends. One of them is his money. And his money says, Ana ma'ak, I'm with you. Right? And when you die, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm with you for khud my shit. So take whatever you want from me because I'm your buddy. Like, you know, take whatever you want from me. The other one is his, Ahluhu, his family, and his family says, I'm with you, and when you die, I will be the one who will lower you in your grave. And the third one is his, Amaluhu, his actions, and his actions say, I'm with you, and when you die, I come out with you. And the man says, I thought you were the least significant of my friends. <laughs> Alright? So in this ayah, On that day, the mal, the money, and the children will be of no benefit. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Now the Mufassireen, they almost unanimously say that Qalbun Salim is a heart that affirmed Allah's one. Right? It's a heart of the Muwahid. It's a heart of the Muslim and the Mu'min. Right? It's a, it's a good heart. It's a, it's a purified heart, if you like. Right? But its basis is that its a heart of Tawheed did not uh, mix, uh, you know, uh, Worship with shirk and so on and so forth, um, uh, and these are the things that the wealth and the kids are the mufassirin. They say are what people would want to ransom uh, themselves with on the day of judgment by way of their wealth and by way of their their children. Um, one thing, of course, that we learn from this ayah is uh, is the element of responsibility that we take for, for ourselves and the way that Allah speaks about this. With a, with a matter of uh, immediacy or urgency in the Qur'an, 
like there's ayahs for example Allah says you know, ya amanu, anfiqu razaqnakum. O you who believe, spend out of what Allah has provided for you. Min qablin yatiya yawmun la bay'un fihi wa la khulla wa la shafa'a Before the, a day comes upon you, when there will be no trade or intimate friendship or intercession. Right? The other verse, wa anfiqu mimma razaqnakum. Spend out of what Allah has provided for you. Before your death comes upon you. فيقول, and the man says, Rabbi, Lola akhartani ila ajadin qareeb, fa sadaqa wa akum mina salihin. If only you delay me for a while, then I would be one of those who I give sadaqa, and be, people become charitable, and I'd be one of the pious ones, right? But it's human responsibility. It's do it now before that day comes upon you, right? You know, fix your things up now before that time comes upon you. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gathered the Quraysh and he says to them, Ya ma'ashiru Quraysh, ishtaru anfusakum min Allah, la ugni ankum min Allah shay'an. O Quraysh, ransom your souls before Allah. Ransom your souls before Allah. Because I can do nothing to help you. Ya banu Abdu Manaf, the same thing, right? To this different tribe, do the same. Because I can't help you. He says to Abbas, his uncle, la ugni ankum min Allah shay'an. He says, Ya Fatima bint Muhammad, his own daughter, la ugni ankum min Allah shay'an. I can't do anything to help you. Right? So he's teaching us and teaching them, take the responsibility for yourself. Right? Don't you can't pass the buck, right? I said, you know, I'm gonna you 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 carry my you carry my load or my burden. Right? It isn't like that. Right? That we are responsible for ourselves. So the essence here is the qalbun salim. It's the it's the heart that is sound, the sound heart. Right? That you know you come to Allah with this, which means of course you have to produce that to Allah. You can't ransom yourselves on the Day of Judgment with your wealth or with your kids. You have to produce what Allah wants from you, and that is a sound heart. Okay? It means you have to make the effort for it. The man once came, he said, and there's many narrations of this hadith with different endings sometimes. But the man came in one narration and he says, Ya Rasulullah, udu'uli, Messenger of Allah, make dua for me. Like we, of course. Ask brothers when they're going Hajj or whatever, traveling, <coughs> remember me in your du'as, all right? He says, Udu'uli. And the Prophet said to him, Inni fa'il. Fa'a'inni ala nafsika bi kathratis sujood. I am a doer of that. But help me to help you by you increasing in sujood. <laughs> right? Help me to help you. Fa'a'inni ala nafsik by you increasing in your sajda, your sujood. Right? Because that will make you then go closer to Allah. Right? It's more likely that your du'as, my du'as for you, your du'as will be accepted. Right? It's a beautiful thing. We should remember that all the time. Uh, in defining the healthy heart, the following has been said. It is a heart cleansed from any passion that challenges what Allah commands. Right? It is a heart that is cleansed from any passions, meaning it doesn't have this obstinacy. Right? It accepts. Sumitna wa al-ta'na. We heard and we obeyed. It doesn't challenge the commands of Allah. SubhanAllah, like, like sadly, a lot of people do, may Allah save us from that. Or disputes what He forbids. Right? So it doesn't make istihlal, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cross wire, if you like. Right? It doesn't make the halal into the haram or the haram into the halal. You know, it's clear. Right? This is why, you know, people who do this, of course, they enter into kufr. They enter into disbelief. Right? Because they don't, they're not ruling by what Allah has revealed. Right? Allah's ruling on khamar or wine is this is haram and they out of obstinacy they say, you know, I don't really care if it's haram or not. <coughs> right? And so they haven't ruled by what Allah has revealed. They're challenging what Allah has forbidden. Uh, but of course the one who is in complete recognition of its forbidden nature but still does it and says I'm a weak whatever, then you know he is simply a sinful person. May Allah help people like that get out of their sin. Um, it is free from any impulses which contradict his good. As a result, it is safeguarded against the worship of anything other than him and seeks the judgment of no other except that of his messenger, sallallahu uh, alayhi And of course, you know, you know the ayat of, of tahakum. You know, of course, that there are the verses that pertain to those who would um, willfully seek the judgment of, of those other than him, sallallahu alayhi wa Right? And Allah mentions them, <coughs> Right? Have you not seen those have you seen those who claim that they believe what was sent down to you? They claim that they believe what was sent down to those before you. But they want to go for judgment to the Ta'awud. 
right? But they were commanded to reject it. But Shaytan wish it is in far and straight. Now the next verse is what? وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When you say to them, تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ Come to what Allah and His Rasul have revealed. رَأَيْتَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يَصُدُونَ عَنْكَ الصُدُودَ You see the hypocrites that turn away from you in disgust, right? That means they don't want to go to the ruling of the Kitab and the Sunnah. They would willfully, right, reject that as a divine source of guidance and arbitration for the disputes and they will go for judgment to the uh, non-Islamic entities. Its services are exclusively reserved for Allah, willingly and lovingly, with total reliance relating all matters to Him in fair hope and sincere dedication. This is how Ibn al-Qayyim described the ilah. وَالَّذِي تَأْلِ الْقُلُوبُ مُحَبَّةً وَإِجْلَالًا وَإِكْرَامًا وَعِنَابًا وَتَعْظِيمًا وَذِلًا وَخُضُوًا وَخُوْقًا وَجَلًا وَتَوَكَّلًا عَلَيْهِ Like ten things, right? This is how our hearts are connected with the ilah. With, you know, submission, with love, with fear, with hope, with trust, you know? With all these kind of attributes and full devotion and respect. Um, when it loves, its love is in the way of Allah. If it detests, it detests in the light of what He detests from the hadith. In Bukhari, uh, the firmest bond of faith, the firmest <coughs> bond of Iman is that you love for the sake of Allah and that you hate for the sake of Allah. The firmest bond of Iman. The hadith in Tirmidhi, Man ahabba fillah wa abghadha fillah wa a'ta lillah wa man'a lillah faqir istakmal al iman. Whoever loves for Allah, whoever hates for Allah, whoever gives for Allah, whoever withholds for Allah, he has completed his Iman. Right? So it's all for Allah's sake, not for personal egos. Right? Not for, you know, you're withholding. You know the famous story of what happened with, um, with Mistah ibn Uthatha, this Sahabi, right, who got caught up in the slander against Umm al Mu'mineen, Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her in abundance. You know the story of what happened, right? Because Mistah was Sahabi and one of the Muhajirin from Mecca to Medina. But what did he do? He was caught up. Of in, the, in the slander that was started by the Munafiqeen, but he caught up in this slander <coughs> to the extent that he began to slander also. What made the matter very, very bad is that he was the cousin of who? Abu Bakr. And Aisha was the daughter of who? Abu Bakr. Right? And what made it even more worse was the fact that this man was poor. Right? And who used to support him and fund him? Abu Bakr. Right? So think about it, it's like the worst case scenario, <laughs> isn't it? Worst case scenario, one on top of the other thing. And the most worst thing is that Abu Bakr's daughter is the wife of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Worst case scenario. Right? So what does Abu Bakr say once he hears about this? <coughs> now he is withholding, you see. But why? Wallahi la unfiq alayhi shay'an abadan. Right? Ba'da, yeah. By Allah, I will not give this man money ever again. After what he said about Umm al Mu'mineen, Aisha, right? What happened? Allah revealed Quran, my dear friends. Allah revealed Quran as per the statement of Abu Bakr. I'll be pleased with him. It is not, it is not, you know, allowed, not befitting that the people of Fadl, people of money, Abu Bakr, who had money, people of privilege, grace amongst you, right, uh, make like oaths that they will stop giving money to those who are from near of kin or from the migrants, emigrants, right, those who made hijrah, right. What does Allah say? Do you not want Allah to forgive your sins? Wallahu ghafur rahim, and Allah is forgiving, all forgiving and merciful. Right? So Abu Bakr, he took a stance, he took a position. I'm not going to give this man money ever again. But look at, you know, we speak about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiving other human beings, other Muslims, right, who have wronged us. Look at, the, look at, the, look at how high Allah brings it, right? Allah is instructing Abu Bakr, although all this has been done to you, right, do you not want Allah to forgive your sins? Abu Bakr made a second oath, by Allah, I will never stop giving this man money ever again. You know? But look at, look at how he raised himself to that level, right? It's a beautiful example of what, it, what does it truly mean when we speak about forgiveness, right? How, to what extent should we forgive 
sometimes we have ego problems. You know, we carry these egos, and I'm going to say sorry, I'm going to say, you know, you're going to say sorry, and I'm going to say, you know, you know, I don't, well, she doesn't speak like that, like, you know, what I'm saying, right? But that's the idea, right? We have these ego problems, and we think, you know, he, he said it, I'm not going to say, well, I'm just going to wait for him, wait for the phone call, you know. But look at, if you really want to be the best, like, we were in the best of days, right? Days of Dhul Hijjah. In one hadith about the best of things, um, it says, Khayrukum, Khayrukum, man idha a'ta shakar, wa idha btuliya sabar, wa idha ghulima ghafar. The best of you. Like the hadith, you know, Khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'an wa allama. The best of you, those who learn the Qur'an and teach it, the best of you. This one is, the best of you are those when they are given, they're thankful. Right? Either a'ta shakar, thankful. And when they're tested, they're patient. And when they are wronged, they forgive. Right? And it's the best of you then. When you're wronged, just bite it. Swallow it. Right? You know, you gotta control yourself and say, Khalas, it's alright. Just forgive to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so it should be done all for Allah's sake, right? Our withholding and our giving and so on and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, all this will not suffice for its salvation uh, until it is free from following or taking as its guide anyone other than his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-iqtida bin nabi this is Jurjani's definition of taqwa al-iqtida bin nabi you know following rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is one of the key uh, pillars of what taqwa is a servant with a healthy heart must dedicate it to its journey's end very important right how important is that she remember the hadith inna ar-rajul la ya'mal zaman at-tawil bi 'amal ahl al-jannah fi ma yabdu lin-nas wa huwa min ahl an-nar a man acts for a long time like the people of jannah until the people will say this is a man of jannah because he's so pious but he's a man of hell jahannam wa inna ar-rajul la ya'mal zaman at-tawil bi 'amal ahl ahl an-nar fi ma yabdu lin-nas wa huwa min ahl al-jannah and likewise, a man will act for a long time like the people of hell until the people will say that about him. He's a man of hell, but he will be a person of paradise. Why? How does the hadith end? Actions are by their end. Actions are by their end. Actions are by the last things that you present Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that you're praying five times a day when you're in secondary school, but by the time that you're dead, you don't even know what the prayer was. You left the prayer a long time ago, right? This is why consistency, right, in the things that we do. This is istiqama. <coughs> this is Ibn Abbas and Sayyid Umar. They just define istiqama as lam yurura wa ghana thalib wa thalib. Don't zigzag like the foxes zigzag. You know, that's the definition of istiqama that the Sahaba gave. You know, when Allah commands the Prophet ﷺ, "Fastaqim" in Surah Tur, I think, "Fastaqim kama umirt." And many ulama they said this was the hardest verse revealed on the Prophet ﷺ. The hardest verse revealed upon him was this verse. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ Be straight as you've been commanded. Right? But Allah commanded the same thing to the Mu'mineen, the Muslimin, with istiqamah in the Qur'an. And the way the Sahaba defined it, they said, it means you don't zigzag like the fox zigzag. You know, you're all, all over the place. You show your face once in Ramadan or whatever. You know, it means you're there. You know, you're thabit. You know, you have thabat. You're firm. You're there. Everyone knows this is what you are. Kind of thing. You know, so... We should, we are, we are fighting until our journeys end, my dear brothers. You, like this story of Imam Ahmad, you know, when he was on his deathbed and the people were coming, and his students, and they were saying, Say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. What is he saying to them? He's conscious, unconscious, he's saying la, la, no, no, no. You know, and they got worried, thinking when well, this is our Imam, right? And, and now he's messing up at his deathbed. You know, what hope do we have, you know? And then he becomes conscious and he says, no, it was shaitan that appeared to me. And shaitan said, you know, uh, great imam, whatever, you know, you have now escaped me. You know, between you and I, things are finished. And he was saying, no, not as yet, until my last breath leaves my body. Then the battle between us and shaitan is over and it's finished. Right? So this is what we end. We are... You know, Allahumma thabitna inda al-mawt bi la ilaha illallah. We're asking Allah, Allahumma thabitna inda al-mawt. Keep us firm upon death uh, with la ilaha illallah. You know, so that our last deeds become, are the best of our deeds. And not the worst of our deeds. Not that we die in the worst situation, in the worst state. Dying in sin.
and dying in the ghafla away from Allah. But the best, of course, and the thing because we don't know when it is that we're going to die. So uh, we should be all the time, like in the hadith, you know, always make your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. Always be in the sake of dhikr of Allah and doing good deeds and so on and so forth. Um, and not base his actions and speech on those of any other person except Allah's Messenger وسلم, He must not give precedence to any other faith or words or deeds over those of Allah and His Messenger وسلم. Allah says, O you who believe, uh, do not put yourselves above Allah and His Messenger but fear Allah for Allah is hearing and knowing. Right. Uh, Alright, should we move on then to the, the other heart? The dead heart, right? This is the opposite of the healthy heart. It does not know its Lord. That's the first thing, right? Like, um, uh, the ulama, they would say things like, you know, man arafa rabbahu habbahu. Whoever knows his Lord will love him. Right? You know, if you don't know Allah, how, how will you love Allah? <coughs> how would you worship Allah if you don't know who your Lord is? فَأَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهُ You must know Allah. You must know there's no ilah except Allah. You must know things about Allah and about His oneness and about His great majesty. This dead heart does not know its Lord um, and does not worship Him as He commands. This is why in the hadith, the long hadith pertaining to the one who is in his grave after he's died, right, what happens when you're buried? It says, the Bism said that you will... Uh, uh, when the person is in, in his grave and he will hear the footsteps of the people who are leaving the grave, you know, uh, then two angels will appear before him, Munkar and Nakir. And if he was a Rajul and Su, if he was an evil person or a disbeliever, uh, the angels begin by saying, you know, Ijlis, sit up. And then he sits up with, like, you know, fear and terror and apprehension. Like confusion, doesn't know what's going to happen to him. And when the angel asks him, Man Rabbuk, like you know, it says he doesn't know his Lord. The angel asks him, Who is your Lord? What does he say? He says, Ha in ha in la adri. Oh, oh, I do not know. Right? Oh, oh, I do not know my Lord. When the angel says, Man Nabiyuk, who is your prophet? Right? So he pauses, <coughs> he doesn't know. Right? And then the angels, in this authentic hadith, the angels they prod him and they say, Muhammad. Right? And, and then the man says, Samitu nas that. I heard the people say that. Right? Like, I heard the people say that, yet yeah, my prophet was supposed to be Muhammad. And when he's asked, Fima kunt, now there's different narrations. One is that, you know, my deen, what's your deen? But the other one is, Fima kunt, in what were you or what were you upon? You know, what were you upon? And the man says to the angels, I heard the people say something, and so I said the same. Right? Like that is utter blind following. Like utter blind following. I heard the people say something, so I just said the same. Right? And then the angel says, inshallah. You lived in doubt, you died upon doubt, and you'll be resurrected upon doubt, inshallah. You know, but as for the one, of course, who knows his Lord, Man Rabbuk, Rabbi Allah, immediately, right? Who is your Lord? My Lord is Allah, right? You know, Man Nabiyuk, Nabi Muhammad, right? And then, you know, Allah sent him with Haq, and we accepted him, and he goes on to say that. And I tell, well, I should Allah in Allah, and he testified that there's no Ilah except Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And then, you know, he says, uh, the angel says to you, you know, Man, um, uh, Fima Kunt, what were you upon? And they, and they say, Kuntu fil Islam, I was upon Islam. And the angel says to him, we knew that you would say that. Right? We knew that you would say that. Because remember, of course, from the Quran, Surah Al-Fusilat, uh, the angels are the awliya, isn't it, of the mu'mineen. Right? In dunya and in akhirah. Right? They are supporting and helping the Muslimin in dunya and in akhirah. Uh, so, that's a, a very beautiful hadith and a very scary one uh, as well. Uh, in, in the way which he likes and with which he is pleased, so he worships Allah based upon the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It clings instead to its. Sorry, this is it. Sorry, my mistake. It does not know its Lord, 
and does not worship him as he commands in the way that he likes. It does not follow the sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with which he is pleased. Um, it clings instead to its lusts and desires even if these are likely to incur Allah's displeasure and wrath. It worships things other than Allah and its loves and its hatreds and its giving and its withholding arise from its whims which are of paramount importance to it and preferred above the pleasure of Allah. Right? That is, that is destruction. You know? Where, and this is how, remember, this is how Ghafla was defined, right? Ibtal al waqt bil mutala mutabi'atun nafs ala ma yashtahi. Following your, wasting your life in unemployment, meaning you're not obeying Allah, worshipping Him, submitting, surrendering to Him, and following your nafs wherever your nafs takes you. Wherever your whims take you, wherever your desires take you. People will act upon impulses. Why do you think there is so much crime? If you read some of the accounts of, the mur of murders, or other things that are less than that, like envy, right? Envy and jealousy and rage, right? Where do people get it from? You know, it's acting upon impulses, isn't it? It's like their love and their, and their hate are dictated by themselves, not by some great external thing or an ideal, for example. All of that is inconsequential for them. It's like act upon the impulse. And there's some horrific stories. There's a very good book I have called Envy by Helmut Schwoke. I think it was his PhD thesis, you know. And what he does is he lists examples of, of crimes upon, of impulse, but his focus is envy. And like he has a, a chapter on murder, murder by envy, right? Killing because of envy. And he has stories like, there was a story in that book about like, um, yeah, one of them was uh, a woman who couldn't have children, right? Uh, was with her friend who could have children, has a child. And the one who doesn't have children takes the friend's child out for a walk in the push chair, pram, right? She herself can't have kids. This is her friend's son or daughter, whatever. And they come to like a, a lake or something, right? And she just pushes the child into the lake and kills it. And when she was asked, why did you do that? She said, because it's not fair that I can't have kids. It's not fair I can't. There's another story how much Schwab brings out in his book where he says like there was a outside of a stadium and there's lots of people gathering around and there was just been a, a sports game of football, American football, whatever. And so the champion of the game who scored the winning goal, the people were putting up him up on their shoulders. He, the guy is a taxi driver, right? And he's driving his taxi and he sees this. And he just turns his car and drives his car straight into the crowd and he kills that champion who scored the winning goal. When he was asked why, he goes, it's not fair. Right? <laughs> it's not fair, but he is the champion, I'm stuck driving a taxi. Right? And yet many, many examples like this. The example of George Sordi, I wrote an article about him, you can see it on the internet, it's called Envy Cuts Its Own Throat. So these examples are fresh in my mind. George Sordi, you know, the man who, uh, this is a few years ago now, like, you know, he, and the guy who had a very good job, right, a very big house, very good car, all these things, these material things are, are with him. But he hadn't had a relationship with a woman for the last like 20 odd years or something. And so he felt uh, bitter, disgruntled, like, you know, this isn't fair, this isn't fair. And he began to write a blog, and he's <coughs> expressing his feelings on, in the blog, saying that this isn't fair, I hate all women, because women hate me, and all this kind of stuff. And then he learns how to shoot, fire a weapon, and he goes to an LA fitness gym, where women are training, he turns the lights off and he kills them, then he kills himself, right? All right, he kills them, and he kills himself. And then the police find his blog at home, right? And simply because it's, it's not fair, right? It's not fair kind of thing, isn't it, yeah? But saying that, then there was even a worse situation, a worse case, uh, within weeks of this one that happened in Kuwait. Maybe you might remember when uh, a Muslim uh, remarried. He had a divorce and he married again, another woman. But the first wife couldn't take it. She felt so uh, bitter that how dare my husband kind of move on like with his life, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she went to the wedding ceremony uninvited and she set fire to the caravan, so, sorry, to the tent, sorry. And, uh, and she killed more than a hundred people, you know. She killed more than a hundred people, you know. And these are all crimes of envy, right? <laughs> in the hadith, do not be envious, you know. In, in a specific case, don't, don't be envious into one another. So we shouldn't uh, be people of whims and desires who are people who act upon impulses. Our frame should be, you know, would it please Allah, right? Would it please Allah if I 
forgave this person? Would it please Allah if I gave this person, right? Not what my impulses and desires are dictating for me. Because if we take that path, we are finished, we're ruined. Right? We're ruined then if we take that path, right? So we should bear that in mind. Um, its whims are its imam, leader. Its lust is its guide. Its ignorance is its leader. Its crude impulses are its uh, objective. It is drunk with its own fancies and its love for hasty, fleeting pleasures. It is called to Allah and the Akhirah from a distance, but it does not respond to advice. Um, uh, and instead it follows any scheming, cunning shaytan. You know, that's the description of the one who has a dead heart. It's immersed in its concern with worldly objectives. His focus is in the dunya. Ibn Qudam al maqtisi for example, he has like five, you know, he has like a, a thing on suhba, on companionship. And he's like specified five qualities for a companion that you should look for when you want to make a companion with someone. Yeah? <coughs> one of them is this. I mean, the first one is, uh, he says, in the aqli, your companion should be intelligent. <laughs> right? It doesn't mean that you get an IQ test done or anything like that, you know. <laughs> but it means, I mean, you shouldn't be stupid. Right? فَلَا خَيْرِ فِي الصُّحْبَةِ الْأَحْمَقِ This is what he says. فَلَا خَيْرِ فِي الصُّحْبَةِ الْأَحْمَقِ There's no good in a stupid friend. Meaning someone who will lead you into danger and that kind of thing, you know. You should be intelligent. No, secondly, he says, حُسْنُ uh, الْخُلُقِ You should have a good character. Third, third one, غَيْرَ fasik should not be an open sinner. Fourth one, should not be مُبْتَدَى innovating the deen. And the fifth one is this, you should not be, like, you know, wanting worldly things, meaning extravagant in the dunya, you know. So we shouldn't be like, be like that, nor should we want company with people who are, who are like that. Um, life angers and pleases it, and passion makes it deaf and blind to anything except what is evil. To associate and keep company with the owner of such a heart is to tempt illness. In the hadith, a man is upon the deen of his friend. So look carefully to who you befriend, isn't it? Look carefully to who you, who you befriend, yeah? So we shouldn't keep company with people like that. Living with him is like taking poison and befriending him means utter destruction. Alright? I think we've come to an end, isn't it? Right, because the one that follows is a sick heart, which we've uh, saved for uh, for next week, inshallah. Um, so, just as a recap, then, my dear brothers, we have today continued with uh, our focus on shukr and its great relevance in this deen. We began from last week, so last week we covered uh, obviously a lot more. Today was just uh, uh, commenting on the importance of thanking others. Uh, as well as thanking Allah. And we gave some emphasis to the parents and to relatives um, and to one another that we should always be people of shukr and always stay jazakallah khairan or thank you or whatever uh, to thank people. Um, and then we moved on to this chapter about <clears throat> the heart. Um, you know, in the hadith, um, In the hadith, indeed, there is a lump of flesh in the body. If it's sound, the rest of the body is sound. If it's corrupt, the rest of the body is corrupt. And he said, indeed, that is the heart. You know, so it is crucial for us to be focusing on the heart. This is a course about the heart, my dear brothers, isn't it? It's a course about inner reform, inner purification, purification of the nafs, right? Purification of the heart, right? This is something that is about the inside, man, and this will exemplify in the outside. Right? There's a lot to come, but even I was thinking in relation to that, think about the hadith about the tongue. Inshallah, we'll do a lot more, inshallah, on the tongue in, in other chapters. Maybe, maybe we'll save it for them, inshallah. Um, and we looked at the two kinds of hearts. We looked at the, um, the one that is dead and the one that is healthy, isn't it? The healthy heart and the dead heart. And what remains is the sick heart. That will, inshallah, cover uh, next week. Bi idnillah. May Allah send His peace and blessings upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa alihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.